All right, folks, in today's video, we're going to talk a little bit about dipole antennas. Dipoles are fantastic antennas for all hams, but specifically for new hams. I'm often approached by folks who are taking their general test or have just passed their general test and they want to get on the air and they ask questions about what they need for a setup. Obviously, an antenna is part of that answer, and I often direct them to dipole antennas. Dipole antennas are relatively inexpensive. They're cheap to purchase and they're cheap to build. They're easy to build and they perform pretty well. Uh, they don't take up a lot of space and they're uh, easy to configure. So as a result, we recommend dipole antennas. Uh, now, before we get started, I did want to mention that down here, you're going to see some buttons, a like button, a comment button, a subscribe button. Go ahead and click them. It'll make you happy. Okay, so hopefully everybody made it back. New hams looking at antenna solutions are often overwhelmed by the vast number and styles of antennas on the market. There really is a lot to choose from. Choosing the right antenna can be intimidating and confusing. Many hams start off with a simple dipole antenna, which is a fantastic or a great way to get started. I want to talk a little bit about this video. This video is a basic introduction to dipoles. There are a lot of topics, and we're not going to go in-depth on all of them. Uh, we're going to focus on half-wave dipoles. There are many different types of dipoles. We're going to lightly touch on a few, but we're really going to focus on half-wave dipoles. As I mentioned, we touch on many topics. Again, this is going to be a very broad, not a very deep conversation. And uh, we're really targeting hams that are new to the hobby, folks who really want to get an antenna up in the air. So the first question is, what is a dipole? It's a simple antenna that's very common. They are a half wave of a desired frequency. So for example, if you were going to operate on, let's say, 14325, which is in the 20 meter band, that frequency has a certain size of wavelength, and a half wavelength would be one half of that. We'll talk more about that as we progress through the slides. Um, it's resonant on a single frequency. Now, you'll hear people say, well, I got a 20-meter dipole, um, and that means that it's, or what they're saying is, is that it's good across the 20-meter band. Well, an antenna is really only truly resonant on one frequency, and then depending upon how broad-banded is, is a term that people use, that antenna is, it's nearly reson, resonant on adjacent frequencies. So it might be tuned for 14.2, uh, but it'll work on 14.250 because of its broadband capabilities. It's nearly resonant. It's not resonant on that frequency. And a dipole antenna has two radiating elements of equal length. Each one of those is a quarter length of the wavelength. Now, there's a diagram here that you can take a look at, and it depicts a very simple dipole with your quarter wave elements feeding into what is called an antenna feed point. Some people will put a ballon or a choke there, and we're going to cover that in subsequent slides. And then you see some feed line depicted. There are a couple of different ways that you can use to feed your antenna with feed line. For this conversation, we're going to talk about coax. Coaxial cable is widely used. It's extremely common. Now, I'm sure somebody's going to come along and say, Ape, I've been using ladder line or window line for 35 years and never had a problem. And that's fantastic. I would love to hear all about it down in the comments. And then your antenna feeds into your radio. Some people will have a tuner in front of their radio. Just some quick other examples. Now, what we looked at in the previous slide is what is referred to as a flat top dipole. And that's when your antenna is perfectly horizontal across. And then you mount the ends of them on two masts or two trees or something along those lines and pull it taut. Um, there's a couple other ways to do this in case you have limitations around mounting your antennas. The first one here depicted is what we would call a sloper. And that's when you take one end of your dipole and you mount it up high, connect it to a tree, mast, corner of the house, maybe the apex of your garage, something along those lines. And then you run it about a 45 degree angle towards the ground, and then you anchor down the other element. It's important to note when you have something like a sloper or the next dipole, an inverted V, you don't want those elements very close to the ground. The reason being is somebody could come along and touch them, and if you're transmitting, they might get a little bit of a surprise. The other one is, is you don't want like your dog or something like that to mess with your antenna. So I would say try to keep those about eight feet off the ground. In the inverted V, you can see that it's just an upside down V. Now, depending upon how much you adjust that angle, um, you can adjust your uh, antenna impedance. So on dipole antennas, we target a 50 ohm impedance. That impedance can be adjusted by the angle of that V. 
We want to have 50 ohm impedance because that's what our radio expects. If you have a mismatch on impedance, then you start to have problems with SWR or standing wave ratio. I want to spend a few minutes talking about different types of dipoles that are multi-banded dipoles. Most dipoles, as I mentioned, are resonant on a single frequency. When you have a multi-banded dipole, such as this example, which is called a fan dipole, this one has two sets of radiating elements. You can buy or build these with multiple sets of radiating elements. But for simplicity's sake, I just included two. So for example, on the flat top portion of this dipole, I may have wires that are resonant on 40 meters cut for the 7 megahertz band. Um, and then coming down at an inverted V, perhaps I would cut that for 20 meters. <clears throat> that way I could use this radio both on the 40 meter and 20 meter band without adjusting the antenna. Um, and I can just switch the frequencies on my radio and I would be good to go. In this image, we depict two different types of dipoles. This could be either a linked dipole or a trapped dipole. And with a linked dipole, where those ovals or circles are across the top portion, what that would represent are connectors, physical connectors that either physically, electrically lengthen or shorten your antenna. So if I have them connected and my antenna is cut for 40 meters, I'm fine operating on 40 meters. What I can do is I can lower my antenna and then break that physical connection. Typically people use some sort of plug or adapter, unplug it, put it back up, and now my antenna is shorter and it would be resonant, say, on 20 meters, for example. A lot of people use these more for portable, not so much for permanent installations because raising and lowering the antenna can be cumbersome. Another thing that you can do is you can put um, a small circuit in line with your antenna, it's called a trap. And what that trap does is it electrically shortens, not physically shortens or lengthens your antenna based upon a certain frequency. So you would put the trap where the residence cuts off at 20 meters, and then you would extend your antenna out to 40 meters. And then that way, without any adjustments on the antenna, without taking it up or putting it down, all you need to do is make a frequency change on your radio, and then you can operate on additional bands. Now, you can put many traps in an antenna. Um, I've seen them where people have five or six on each side, so that way they get a lot of bands. But you're talking about a very large, cumbersome antenna at that point. So what I mentioned was at the feed point of an antenna, folks will often put a ballon or a choke in there. So I wanted to spend a few minutes talking about that. The term ballon refers to a device that is used in antenna systems to match impedance between an antenna and a feed line. Generally, this match is between a balanced antenna, such as a dipole. It's balanced because it has two equal legs. Um, and an unbalanced feed line, such as coaxial cable. Coaxial cable is considered unbalanced. Um, and that's where the name ballon comes from. It's a combination of the two words, balanced to unbalanced. A ballon can either be a voltage or a current ballon. Most people are using current balance today. They're more popular than voltage, voltage balance, <laughs> that's a lot of words, um, that were used in the past. Now, I know somebody's going to come on here and say, hey, I've been using voltage balance 35 years, never had a problem. Well, that's fantastic. I would love to hear all about it down in the comments below. Now, what I refer to as a choke, some people call as a ballon, but chokes are for reducing common mode current or EMI, electromagnetic interference, or radio frequency interference, RFI. Um, as mentioned, people refer to chokes as ballons, ballons as chokes. There's a lot of confusion around that topic. But the reason that you want to use one of these is because your antenna can become susceptible to alternating current <coughs> uh, coming down on your uh, coaxial cable on the outside of the shield. And we're going to take a look at a picture of that right now. So I don't know who originally drew this picture, but I want to say thanks because it's very handy. If you go onto the internet and you type in dipole antennas and RFI, you're going to see this picture. And what's depicted are the two arms of the dipole across the top. Now, AC current is what we use when transmitting on an antenna. Um, this is a differential mode current, meaning that when current is going one direction, it has also come in the other direction. So in this picture, you can see on arm one, <clears throat> there is a, uh, a label, it's called I1. So I is short for current. And that current is coming in off of R1 down the center connector of our coaxial cable. At the same time, I2 is coming out of our coaxial cable, and it's riding on the inside of the shield. And the shield is outside this dielectric insulation on your coaxial cable. And that current is running on the outside and going out the opposing arm of your dipole antenna. Now, what can happen is a little bit of this uh, current can do a U-turn and come down as depicted as I-13 on this chart. Now, 
electronic current wants to find its way to ground. And so what happens is, is that this current comes down, traverses your coaxial cable, comes into your radio, can even actually charge your radio so you can get shocked from touching it. It can cause havoc inside your radio, giving you trouble uh, receiving or transmitting signals. It makes your coaxial cable part of your antenna system, um, and then it will come in and attempt to go to ground. You can use a choke to stop this current on the outside of your shield and your coaxial cable. I put it on all of my dipole antennas that I build, and I wouldn't buy an antenna unless it had a choke ballon in it. Um, now, I know some people are going to be like, hey, Bob, I've been building dipole antennas 35 years, never used a choke, never had a problem. And that's fantastic. I'd love to hear all about it down in the comments below. What I am going to say is, is that this is real. You can't see CMC, but you can experience it. Um, and what you want to do is you want to eliminate it because it can be problematic. Now, you might not have a problem, but the chances are you will have a problem. Here's an example of a dipole antenna build that I did. And then you can see I used a ferrite toroid, a uh, F140-43 mix. Um, and then I just used, did some wrapping of wire around that antenna, and I put that in line with my feed line and uh, my dipole antenna elements. It was very simple to do, very easy to build. Um, the blue uh, antenna feed point connector is something I printed out on my 3D printer. All in, that's probably t less than $20 worth of parts. Now we're going to talk a little bit about radiation patterns of dipole antennas. And dipole antennas can have an aspect of directionality in terms of gain, meaning that the way that you mount your antenna, north or south or east or west, can impact where you hear signals the strongest. Now, if you take a look at this, we used an application called MMANA-GAL. It's a free application that you can download off of the internet. And what we're looking at here on the left-hand side is um, a dipole antenna, let's just talk about a horizontally mounted dipole antenna, is running across, if you can imagine, that Y axis. And you can see that there are some indentations in what you would call your lobes or radiation pattern there. At the x-axis, all the way north and south on this picture, you can see it's at zero. And that zero goes down to negative three, negative 10, negative 20, negative 40. And that's in reference to your gain that you get on your antenna. A dipole antenna is a reference antenna for measuring gain or comparing other antennas. So your max gain on your dipole is always going to be zero because it's a reference number. Now, when you look at the diagram on the left, what that is is a cross view if you're looking straight on at your antenna. The one on the right is if you're looking down at your antenna, um, and that is your radiation pattern that you can't see, but if you, had a, if you had a strength meter, you could go out there and you could measure that. This is a 3D depiction of that dipole antenna, and it's important to note that in this example, this dipole antenna is in what we call free space. That means it's way, way up in the air, outer space, wherever, where it's not impacted by external factors. And when I talk about external factors, I'm talking about the ground, for example. The closer an antenna or the further away your antenna is from the ground, it will impact your radiation pattern. Also, things like flagpoles, rain gutters, uh, swing sets, all of that, trees, houses, garages, all of that can impact or influence your radiation pattern. But we look at a dipole in free space so we can get that reference that I talked about earlier and understand the mechanics of, of uh, radiation patterns and antennas. So in this diagram, we're taking a look at an antenna that is uh, 10 meters off the ground. So for a dipole antenna, what you want to do is you want to mount that half a wavelength of the of the wavelength of your antenna. When you start to look at multi-banded dipoles, that's where it gets complicated. So that's why we're leaving this conversation to, to single and uh, single half wave dipoles. So you can see that 10 meters off the ground, those indentations that we talked about along the Y axis have gotten lessened. Now you're still at a negative dB relative to the X axis. So this antenna is gonna perform a little bit better in this example, north and south. On the right-hand side, you can see that that donut has kind of gotten squished down a little bit. And then you have stronger lobes where you're concentrating or focusing energy. You know, folks will say that if you use directionality or you mount your antenna right, you get more power. Well, you do get more power, but you really don't get more wattage. What you're doing is, is that you are kind of squishing that, that radiation pattern down and you're taking power from one direction and adding it into another one. Here's a 3D depiction, and again, the dipole runs across the y-axis of our 20-meter dipole 
mounted 10 meters above the ground. And then here you can see that we don't have that donut shape anymore. It's kind of more like a peanut shaped <laughs> shape laying on the ground. Um, and then you have more directionality. And that's one of the reasons why we like dipoles. But it's important to make sure that you have them mounted at a correct height, generally half a wavelength. So in this one, I did the diagram, I did the analysis, and I put the dipole at 15 meters. So you'll hear a lot of people say things like, height is might, get that dipole as high as you can, boy. And, um, you know, maybe that's good advice. I don't think it is. Uh, when you take a look at this, we start to see those nulls along our y-axis indent more than we had previously. Again, the x, -ax -x, the, <laughs> the x axis being our reference plane is still at 0 dB. Now, when you take a look on the right-hand side of this, you can see that our lobe pattern has changed. Remember when I talked about concentrating energy, uh, taking it from one area and put it into another one? So the lobes on the bottom part of this have gotten smaller, and now you have a big, gigantic lobe at the top. All of that energy is just going to go straight up into the sky and just heat up clouds. It's not going to help you make any kind of contacts. And then here's a 3D model depicting that. So again, you want to be really careful about how high you mount your dipole. Pay attention to what you're doing, and if you're not getting your signal out and you're not hearing well, make some adjustments. So I wanted to talk a little bit about building versus buying antennas. And here I have hams are faced with decision to build or buy a dipole. Neither option's right or wrong. You got to do what's right for you. Um, buying is quick and easy, and you may get some vendor support. You do pay a little bit more for that convenience. Um, a lot of people put a lot of pressure on new hams being like, son, you need to build your dipole. If you can't build your dipole, you're an appliance operator. You shouldn't be operating. I don't feel that way. Um, dipoles can easily be built with materials that you likely have on hand. It's an educational experience. It's very rewarding, and you might save a buck or two. I would encourage people to build their own dipole, but I wouldn't criticize somebody for not doing that. There's nothing wrong with going out and buying a dipole. Um, again, dipoles are relatively inexpensive. They're easy to use. They're, they're highly efficient. And there's a reason why they're the reference antenna, because they're efficient. Um, whether you build it or buy it, just go out and get yourself an antenna and get it on the air. So I wanted to close out the conversation. Now, whether you build or buy a dipole, they're a great way to get on the air, as well as a great way to learn the hobby. Um, as mentioned, they are low cost, whether you build it or buy it. Um, they're easy to mount, and there's many configurations, and we talked about that versatility earlier in the slide deck. Um, they're easy to maintain. If your dipole breaks, you just get another element and you put it on there. Um, you will have to maybe buy some connectors and stuff like that, but they're very simple in nature. Um, they don't take up much space, and that is, a, that is a very positive thing. Now, when you start talking about giant dipoles, like 80-meter dipoles, they're going to take up more space because they're longer, and they're going to require more space to do that run. But it's not like it takes up a whole bunch of space in your yard. It's just in the air above you, and you'll need a place to mount that. Um, and they perform well. So anyhow, that's where I'm going to say thanks for watching, everybody. I really appreciate it. If you have any questions, comments, recommendations, suggestions, go ahead and post them below, and I'll do my best to respond. Thanks again.